Okay. I'll introduce uh, Gina Lynn. She uh, is a Capitol Hill attorney, sole practice, and has been um, doing things for older people uh, throughout her career, and, and including legal aid to the elderly. And she's doing a lot of estate probate work now. And she has an office on the Hill. She has lived on the Hill for a long time. Since 1987. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and I reared two kids. Yay. So she's, she's, part of, uh, she's part of our territory. <laughs> so um, over to you, Gina. Okay, great. Well, yep, um, so I'm Gina Lynn, and my office is on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, not far from Frager's on the 1000 block. Um, and uh, I was asked by Susan to talk about powers of attorney. Originally, it was just going to be health care powers of attorney. And then we expanded it to be financial powers of attorney and health care powers of attorney. Um, so I'm going to go through some considerations about what happens when you have these documents and what happens when you don't have these documents. And we'll try to um, answer any questions that you have. And I'll try to speak slowly because I often get in trouble for speaking too quickly. So if you can't, if I'm speaking too quickly, just please uh, let me know. So uh, as a friend of mine used to say when we would do these seminars, he would always say, if you don't have an estate plan, the government has an estate plan for you. So what happens if you don't have powers of attorney? So uh, if you don't have a financial power of attorney, uh, it's really bad news because that means that a court uh, case is going to have to be brought on your behalf. So someone named a conservator can be appointed uh, for you to manage your financial affairs. Um, because even though you may own things jointly with your spouse or with your adult kids, certain assets uh, cannot be transacted upon by someone else without proper legal authority. And the biggest asset that comes to mind is real estate. So you can own your house jointly with your husband or with your daughter. And if one of you, you gets incapacitated, the other one would have to have a conservator appointed if they don't have a financial power of attorney. So it's a super um, important document to have. And luckily, everyone knows what a conservator now is because of Britney Spears. So thank you, Britney. <laughs> but uh, you definitely don't want to be involved in these court proceedings because they're very expensive. Lawyers make a lot of money um, from these proceedings because they last, they can last the entire life of the person um, for whom a conservator is appointed. Now, if you don't have a health care power of attorney, we're going to get into that later. It's not, not such a sad story. Um, <clears throat> but uh, So we highly suggest that everybody have a financial power of attorney. And it's not a very complicated form. There is a form online uh, that's part of the existing financial power of attorney statute, the law in the District of Columbia. And that's part of my um, backup materials, which I'll, I'll give to Susan. She can make available on the website. Um, however, I always recommend that an attorney help you with your financial power of attorney because there's a lot of consider just having the form in and of itself might not be everything that you need. For example, in the District of Columbia, because we have so much fraud in this jurisdiction, basically the, the real estate uh, lawyers decided that there had to be special language on your power of attorney in order for it to be valid for real estate. And when you s go and get the form off the DC Council's website, that language is not there because you ha you're supposed to know to go to this other statute that has the real estate um, language. So that's something an attorney can help you with. Then there's other, that for the financial, we're still on the financial. So, and then um, you want to make sure that your power of attorney is durable. And the word durable in this context doesn't mean like a floor is durable if, if you spill, you know, grape juice on it. It means um, that it survives your incapacity. So the power of attorney should say it's durable so that it's good now, but it's also good if you have a stroke and you can't understand things and, and you can't transact for yourself. Um, but we highly, highly, highly recommend that you don't make the power of attorney what's called springing. And springing means it only springs into effect if you're incapacitated. And if you re uh, require that the person acting for you can only act if you're incapacitated. That means, say I'm power of attorney for my mother, and she has all her assets at Fidelity. And her power of attorney says, Gina can only act for me if I'm incapacitated. I have to contact her doctor. I have to get her doctor to write a, up a certificate saying that 
Uh, she's incapacitated to get her doctor to sign that certificate. I have to send that doctor, uh, doctor's certificate to Fidelity. They have to send it to their lawyers. They have to review it, and it has to be okay. <clears throat> and financial institutions love saying no because they, they want to protect against liability. So they don't want to allow this unless it meets all the little criteria that they might have. Yes? Yes, uh-huh. Um, I understand some ins financial institutions want their own That's right, yep, and I was going to get to that. So we often recommend, even if you go to a lawyer and you spend all this money and get a super fancy uh, power of attorney, it's still a good idea to go to the, your major financial institutions and execute the forms that they have. So if like all your money's with Bank of America or Merrill Lynch, I would suggest having, uh, calling your person at Bank of America or Merrill Lynch and saying, hey, can I get that power of attorney form signed because I want my husband, I want my adult daughter, I want my friend to uh, sign their form. And that way, it's in their computer, nobody has to review it, and they call up, like, I, I use my mother again, she has her retirements at TIA, CREF, so we did that form with TIA. So now if I call TIA, they, they say, oh yeah, you're Gina, you're in our computer. They didn't have to review the documents because it was their documents that we signed. But <clears throat> usually those documents do have to be notarized. And the power of attorney that uh, you, know, you would prepare or a lawyer would prepare would be uh, notarized and usually has one or two witnesses. In Maryland, they have a form power of attorney and it requires signature, it requires a notary, and it requires two witnesses. Um, so, getting back to the springing issue about making the document effective immediately, um, <clears throat> I was uh, in a seminar a long time ago and an attorney said the reason that you should make it effective immediately is because if you don't trust someone when you're capacitated, you certainly shouldn't trust them when you're incapacitated. And when you think about it, if you're capacitated, you can keep an eye on them, right? <laughs> you look at your Bank of America statement and you see they stole the $100,000 and you call MPD and you say, we have a serious problem here. No, I mean, first of all, the, the real reason is that you have to pick someone that you absolutely trust. And if you don't trust them, if you have any hesitation, any doubt, um, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't pick them. And I have one client, she had a longtime boyfriend, but she didn't feel comfortable giving him a power of attorney. We kept going through all these different people in her life. She didn't trust anyone. And I said, okay, that's fine, but you have to understand if you get incapacitated, someone's gonna have to go to court and get appointed. And, and for her, that's a better situation because she's just not comfortable doing it. So everybody has their own level of comfort, and if you're not comfortable with it, it's okay. Um, and sometimes people encourage if you're picking between people, you know, it's obviously easier to have someone who's local serve in that role. Because if you're, uh, yes? Can you have more than one person? You can have more than one person, but usually it's recommended that you have just one person and a series of alternates. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes people have two people acting together, but then it gets confusing as to whether they have to agree, and whether they both have to sign, or if they each have independent authority. One person, you know, gets one realtor to sell the house and the other person gets another realtor to sell the house and all of a sudden you have a problem. So that, that could be um, an issue. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, one way to control people acting under your power of attorney is to keep, keep tabs on the original. Keep tabs on the copies. Don't give 15 copies to 15 different people. Um, you know, make sure that the person who is going to be acting as your power of attorney only has access to the documents if you need, if they actually need it. So what I encourage my clients to do is keep their documents in a safe place <clears throat> in their house, hopefully in a fireproof, fireproof place, and then the person who's named in their document, their attorney in fact, or sometimes called their agent, that they have the key or this uh, combination to that box, and they go in and they get the document when they need it. In the age of computer documents, every, you know, we now send our documents out to our clients' PDFs you know, after they've all been signed. And I would imagine the clients you know, download them to their computer and then they say, oh, well, Mary's my um, financial power of attorney. I'll just email her this document. And then Mary says, oh, I'll email it to the, the, the alternate so if something happens. You know, and then all of a sudden, 15 people have it. So it's even more important in the era of um, PDFs and emails to keep things uh, 
I would say, close to the vest until they're actually needed. Um, and then <clears throat> one thing you can do to make sure your um, power of attorney is publicly accessible if you want is you can record it at the Recorder of Deeds office. And actually, it does have to get recorded at the Recorder of Deeds office if you're using it for a real estate transaction. Um, and uh, then it becomes a public record. Yeah. And then... Um, <clears throat> happen upon execution or when they need to, or when well that's you, you can either record it after it's it's all signed up and, uh, you know just to have it there so it doesn't get lost because someone would accept a, a copy from the recorder of deeds office as evidence of the original uh, or most of the time it gets recorded as part of the real estate transaction um, so uh, getting back to who you, whom you should pick as the agent, you should you know, pick someone who's well organized, who's financially sa savvy, who's not gonna lose everything, <laughs> like some of us do, and um, you know, someone who's local if, if you're deciding uh, between uh, people. But I have plenty of clients who don't have anyone local, and you know, their idea is like their adult child would fly in from Colorado if you know, needed to do what needs to get done. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, if, if some, you know, you sort of think, oh, if your adult kids live in Colorado and you had a, you know, their parent had a stroke, they would come in anyway. They would get the documents. Now, with everything being email, they would just have to e email the documents to whomever. But sometimes the financial institutions do want you to show up in person, you know, like Bank of America, uh, and they're kind of famous for that. Um, and you have to present your ID and kind of go through their whole process of being in their system before they'll recognize you. <clears throat> so we already talked about the execution requirements, um, the notary and one witness is a good idea. It's good to have two witnesses. Um, now we're gonna talk about some more advanced things regarding powers of attorney. When you see the more complicated ones, they generally address issues such as, do you want your agent or attorney, in fact, the person who's named in your power of attorney who's gonna be acting for you, to be compensated for all these services. Generally, most people you know, who serve for family members, like I'm not gonna charge my mom you know, for calling TIA and dealing with her retirement, but if I was doing it for a friend of mine, I would probably say, hey, if I have to take off time from my job, I'm gonna have to charge you for this. And actually, I did wind up serving as power of attorney for a friend of mine, and I told him straight up, I said, I'll do it, but you know, since I'm going to be taking time off work and stuff, I'm I'm going to be charging. He's like, I'm okay with that. You're a lawyer, you know. So that's really something between you and the person. You know, if it is a friend, you might want to discuss that with them because it, it's it's time consuming. You know, you go sit at Bank of America for two hours and wait uh, for your papers to get processed, or you you know have to sell a home. You have to meet with the realtor and do this and do that. So there's a lot involved in acting as an agent in this capacity. Yeah, no, it's what's reasonable. So, you know, what's reasonable is like, what do you get paid at your job? And what kind of services did you do? You know, if you're just going grocery shopping and it's something that you could have charged 20, you know, could have paid someone else $20 an hour to do, you can't charge $80 an hour, you know, but if you have some tax savviness and you're doing turbo tax for the person, you know, you probably could charge $80 an hour, so. But this, most form powers of attorney do not allow the compensation, so the compensation has to be addressed in a special document. And then um, gifting is another big one. So most um, form powers of attorney that you see that are more complicated than the form that's online, they'll say, "Oh, gifts are okay as long as what they're called what, or as long as what they're called exempt gifts." So exempt gifts means um, you don't have to file a gift tax return. So right now the exempt uh, exempt gift limit is $16,000 a year. So usually the document will say, you know, my agent may make gifts uh, not, no more than the exempt amount to, to my descendants, which would be uh, your kids and your grandkids and your great-grands if you're lucky enough to have some, yes. So gifts, what if someone decides to donate to like a charity? Well, that's interesting. So some, I've seen documents and I've written in documents that gifts to descendants or continue charitable um, contributions to which I was accustomed to. So like if you always had a thing of giving 
certain amount to your church every year, they could keep going with that because you did it in the past. But you wouldn't want to leave just total discretion. You know, you'd want to kind of set forth what was, re not the actual names of the charities, but that to follow the pattern that you had before. And then um, there's always a tricky issue about gifting to the agent themselves. Um, <clears throat> but that kind of gets into the next thing I was going to say, which is um, you can actually, uh, so it, if you really trust the person, it can be a good idea to leave the gifting very broad for two reasons. One is if you, the person needs to qualify for Medicaid. So say you have you know, $800,000 or something, and the, you're incapacitated, and the person acting under your power of attorney says, you know what, if I give to family members and to charities that I know the person liked, I can spend down, and then I'll be closer to having, uh, qualifying for Medicaid. So a lot of Medicaid planning lawyers will tell you, make sure your gift provision is very, very broad. Another reason to have a very broad uh, gift uh, power is um, to help with estate planning. Like I had a client and his dad always kept his finances very close to the vest. Then his dad got dementia and he figured out his dad had like way too much money, great problem to have, but he was gonna have like a serious estate tax problem. So because his dad had executed a power of attorney that was very broad in the gifting power and said you can gift a whole lot as long as it saves on estate tax, he was able to set up these types of trusts that were gonna help save estate tax money down the road. Um, so the next item on the outline is we already talked about is the um, forms at the financial institutions. That's always recommended, yeah. So I suppose following on that, that you would want then to convey somehow to your um, agent the kinds of gifts yeah. that you give. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or they would just look at your, you know, tax return from last year and see, oh, she gave to her church and she gave to the Sierra Club and she okay. gave, you know, to Planned Parenthood, okay. you know. Or, yeah, sure, you could keep a list or tell them, you know. Is that still on our returns? Pardon? It, it, I mean, now maybe the preparation for your return. I don't think the actual donees, yeah. yeah. The return just has the right, the amount, yeah. Yeah, standard, yeah, standard yeah. Standard yeah. But now when we, no, when we put our stuff. Even when, you, even when you itemize, it's not on the schedule. Like yeah. The but you're fee. supposed to give your tax preparer, like, the list, right? Like, yeah. I gave and this much. Turbo tax, you, you oh, list turbo tax, out. In turbo tax you, if you don't take the standard deduction, you do list out right. who you got, who you But if you do take it, it and use turbo tax, it wouldn't be listed. Mm -hmm. So you have to give it to them. Yeah. The other one is the qualified uh, minimum. Right. Right. Which is. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question because that's another category that I probably should have put on the form is the um, power to mess with beneficiary designations. Right. So your agent might figure out, you know, what Susan's talking about. Oh, I can save money for this person if I change to instead of them getting their minimum required distribution every year, I'll send it to their church because they give money to their church anyway. Um, and everybody will save money. I thought that's what you were talking about. In terms of keeping track of the donations, so your person would know who you give money to. Oh, right. This is a very interesting Yeah, about retirement benefits, yeah. That they, well, I have a client, and I did uh, draft her power of attorney, and she said, I specifically do not want my agent to be able to change my beneficiaries. So, you know, that's how she feels. Well, um, she, she's talking, my client in that instance was talking about retirement benefits. Okay, okay, all right. Oh, interesting. Yep. You're incapacitated, your agent can, can come along yeah, yeah. and yeah. adjust. But they can clean you out anyway, so it really doesn't oh, okay. make a difference. Okay. If you don't trust them, you know, they shouldn't be your agent. That's what I always say. Well, let's assume an honest misunderstanding. <laughs> Okay, so revocation. Um, so if you want to revoke your power of attorney, you need to let them know in writing that their uh, power has been revoked. That's if they've used it already. If they don't even know because it's been in their drawer all that time, I wouldn't send them a written notification. But if they've been using it, I sure would. And I would especially 
you know, say they went to, um, you know, Capital One Bank and started using it there, you sure should let Capital One Bank know that it's revoked. Um, so revocation is, is something that's important. Um, and I hope everybody knows that your power of attorney is at death because I have all these clients and they, you know, someone died and they're, well, I, I'm writing checks. And I say, oh, how are you doing that? Well, I have power of attorney. Well, sorry, that was supposed to stop when the person died. So that's that. What time are we supposed to end? 205, okay. Well, how do you, um, uh, if the power of attorney ends, how do you do things? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So that gets into the whole wills versus trust the debate. Okay. Yeah, well, the will doesn't do it. The will has to be probated, and you have to, the person who's okay. the personal representative, what they used to call executor, has to have uh, authority from the court. So in D.C. now, because our superior court is still operating, semi-remotely, uh, it's taking a lot longer to get uh, letters of administration yeah, than it used to. Yeah, that's all right. But things that are on auto pay just go on auto Yeah, well, that's really interesting. That's a whole nother issue of the, well, the legality of people logging into, you know, like if I was to log on to my mom's, like, Chase account, you know, technically that's against a federal law, right, because you're not supposed to pretend you're someone else. And people die, and people say, well, I was still in his account, and I saw the Pepco went, and the washing gas went. You know, you're not supposed to do that, but, and it should end, really, upon death, but right. it doesn't, you know. It's, it's a thing I worry about the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Because it's drawn automatically. Yeah, away. yeah. I worry, actually. That, that if you passed away or whatever. If I passed away before probate was done, Yeah. Well, you have to pass away before probate. You can't have probate no, before I mean, you pass before away. Before they finish the, I pass away. And before they finish the probate, something, well, the mortgage has house. to keep. No, that takes forever. Yeah. They don't yeah. repossess your house. You cannot pay your mortgage in D.C. for like two or three years. And you can just live there. And eventually your house will be get foreclosed on. Yeah. 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 Yeah
to be her health care agent. Um, so the health care power of attorney is a more informal document, and there's also a form available in the DC code. Um, it does not have to be notarized. It just have to have two witnesses um, witness your signature, and they shouldn't be relatives or health care providers. Um, and it's a good idea. Some attorneys and people, they kind of have the document, and then they have a sheet attached to it with all the other contact information, so it's easier to update about, you know, oh, I named Jane Doe, and this is her current address and phone number, but then attached to it is, oh, Jane Doe moved, and this is her new address and phone number. And when you think about it these days, you know, email is probably good to have that contact information too, since people don't answer their phone if they don't, <laughs> don't know the number. Uh, so that's important. And then when you finish your um, health care power of attorney, it's good to give a copy to your primary treating physician so it can become part of your medical record. And then for my powers of attorney, which are, um, I put them together with the living will, which we're going to be talking about in a minute, I have another sheet um, that provides the um, HIPAA release. So HIPAA is Health Care Information Privacy Something Act, which is when you go to the doctor now, you know how they won't tell you anything unless you prove you're really you, and they won't tell you anything about your husband or your kids. So if you have a HIPAA release, it says, yeah, give information to the person who's named in my financial power of attorney because they might need it for something. Give it to the person named in my health care power of attorney. The form I use says, give it to my estate planning lawyer so they can figure out if I'm capacitated or incapacitated. Um, and then importantly, the HIPAA, uh, the regs regarding HIPAA requires that there's an expiration date. Like, can't say forever and ever. So mine says, like, something like five years after up to five years after I die or something. Really? Yeah. Extension. Yeah. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it see some death like the other power of attorney? I don't know. I, that's just what uh, the form says. I think it's okay. okay. Um, so the most important thing is that you talk to your health care agent um, so that you know uh, what, so they know what your values are. And there, later, um, Ari, is that right? Are you going to be giving the seminar about the um, Five Wishes book? Yes. So what I really like about the Five Wishes book is it's very um, easy to understand language, and there's a lot of choices and boxes to check, and it causes two people to have a conversation. You know, so I've been married for 20 years. You know, I sort of think I know what my husband would like in most of these situations, but if I went through the book with him, we'd have to sit down and say, oh, yeah, well, what if that happened? What would you do? Oh, yeah, well, what would you do? and see if we're the same or if we're different. Because if we're different, if I'm acting for him, I'm supposed to put his hat on and pretend I'm him. That's what substitute consent's all about. So like, if I was married to Susan and she was a Jehovah's Witness and I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, and she says no blood transfusion no matter what, even though I would do a blood transfusion for me, I'm saying, I'm Susan now, no blood transfusion. You know, so you always have to make sure that you're, um, acting according to the values of the person named in the, in the document. Yeah. And they do have special um, health care powers of attorney for Jehovah's Witness and for some other um, uh, religious uh, sects that are available. Like usually when I have clients who are something like that, they'll just bring one from their church or something and we'll just incorporate that into the document. And I always tell people, that the health care power of attorney and the living will, you can really write whatever you want. You know, with the financial power of attorney, I wouldn't recommend that because it's a lot, a lot of legal stuff. But the, but the health care power of attorney and especially the living will is more about, you know, what your values are. Are health care powers of attorney portable? And by that I mean... Can you take them from state to state? Exactly. Mm -hmm. if, if, like I live here, but right. my family lives up in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Imagine a scenario where if I'm incapacitated, right. they transport my body up there because that way they can. Right, right, and they, they really are. Um, and and there's an, there's a whole movement in the law toward uniform laws, and even the financial power of attorney, they're trying to standardize among states through the uniform law. Um, but the healthcare power of attorney, there's a great thing about the Five Wishes books is most states only require the two witnesses, no notary. And the Five Wishes book says itself which states require two witnesses and a notary. So we can look at it during Ari's. Uh, yeah, six states that um, don't require a notary. Right. 
Right. So now we're going to talk about living wills. I'm going to try and talk more slowly because we have a lot of time to fill up. <laughs> Uh, so living wills um, are important because the law provides that if you don't have a living will, basically the doctors have to do everything they can to keep you alive. So you could be uh, 100 years old and you could be in the hospital and your heart stops beating. The example they always use is, oh, then they would have to give you CPR and, and um, bring your, you know, resuscitate your heart and they would break your ribs and you'd be in all this pain and it's horrible. Um, and that's uh, being called full code. Um, and the idea, if you have a living will, is that you want to be what's called DNR, which is do not resuscitate. Um, and that's only if you're terminally ill that you were going to die anyway. And I shouldn't have used the example of a 100-year-old guy because he might not have been terminally ill. But maybe he just decided that time he just doesn't want any more. Um, so I've got to ask you a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, there she was in the hospital, and it was, it was a bad scene. And this wonderful nurse came and talked to me about the do not resuscitate order. Yeah. It's obvious that I must have been the person in charge because I was the, the child. Yeah. And I, it took me a while to do it. And I finally, on my computer, I, I guess my sister-in-law had sent me a copy of the advanced directive. So I spent time reading it really carefully to make sure that yeah. Before I said, but but here you're saying that maybe the DNR is embedded in the advanced directive. Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering whether. They no, 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 no. Okay. I would say I would say like, how do you get to be from okay from full code to DNR? Okay. Okay. So this is basically, I I signed the form. Right, and then they're going to change the order they're in the in her chart. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So basically, I always tell people my experience. I used to um, serve in the guardianship system in the court. And I was appointed by the court to, to be guardian and conservator for in, incapacitated individuals. And a lot of those people are in hospitals or they're in long-term care facilities. And everybody has a chart, right? And the chart says what the orders are. What's their doctors? How often are they supposed to see the doctor? What did their last you know, psychiatric evaluation say? What are their prescriptions? You know, how often are they supposed to be turned? All that stuff is in their chart. And in the, all right, on the, right on the outside of the chart, it says full code or no code. And um, basically, if you have a living will, you're telling everybody ahead of time that if you're terminally ill, you don't want to be full code. But the doctor has to order that. Oh. So he has to, and that's the cool thing about the most, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The difference is a living will is a document that you do. Um, and the most is one that you do with your doctor. But because the doctor signs it, it says on itself, this is a medical order. And this is going to supersede any other medical order. So you can say all the things you want, but if the doctor doesn't order it, it's not going to happen. It's my experience. I have a question. Yeah. Clearly, um, the living will and the advanced directive, are those terms interchangeable? Pretty much, yeah. Some people use the advanced directive term for the health care power of attorney, but I think that's very confusing. Okay, I understand uh, living will is like an umbrella. Well, advanced mm -hmm. directive is for both. Some people do it that way, too. Do you mean to say that you could have a living will, but if you don't have a most? No, I mean, no, I mean to say you can have a living will, and if the doctor didn't order you to be DNR on your chart, it's not going to happen. Oh, okay. And then you get into this whole issue of, I, I don't know if the last speaker addressed this already, but, you know, when you're home, say you're really sick, you had stage 4 cancer, you just don't want anything anymore, and you're at home on hospice, right? And um, something happens to you and your neighbor comes in, and sees you on the floor, they call 911, the fire department comes, and the ambulance people, and oh, let's restart our heart, you know? Because they don't know that you have this DNR, even though the doctor's ordered in your chart your DNR, how do they know? So now they have these bracelets and stuff, like if you're in hospice, I think they give you a bracelet, and that tells the emergency people, don't do anything, don't take me to the hospital. And the same, that, you know, if this is in your chart, I don't know if they would know about that, though, unless you were under D.C. government care. That's interesting. You said, I had heard that, that if you call 911, their job is to keep you alive. Right. They have to. the hospital where they're going to keep you alive. And that you need to do, but the fact is, 
is that um, what you going back here? Yeah. Is that if the, the doctor has to make the actual order, and you can say legally, this is what I want to do. Yeah. The doctor has to take right. Action. Exactly. Okay. And then, yeah. and then same thing. And how do you protect yourself when you're home? Yeah. Having you know tattooed or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> The DNR posted on the yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think some people have, yeah, I don't know. You know, it depends who, right, if they read it, yeah. In addition to the fridge, common places like the front door or over above the bed with some other tips that I've heard. Yeah, it's kind of like people have those signs, the pets live here. <laughs> but you can also get into more detail than just DNR, kind of as, you know, the old days it pretty much referred to just restarting your heart. Now people say, oh, do not intubate, you know, which is don't go on a, don't go on a breathing machine, which everybody was very upset during COVID. Every time I did a living well during COVID, they were like, does this mean if I get COVID, they're not going to put me on a respirator? I'm like, no, because you're not terminally ill. You just have COVID and you're, hopefully you get on the respirator and you get off the respirator. It's, the question is, how long do you want to be there and do you want to be reliant on the, on the um and then also people, a uh, guy took care of an older lady, and she was in a nursing home, um, and she, the way they did it in their charts, it said, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, do not um, hospitalize. She didn't want to go to the hospital, and she did not want dialysis, because dialysis can keep you going quite a long time. So I think the most form also has um, some of those. Um, Gina, what age do we, you know, there's, we all have these different ages. Yeah. And at what age, you know, we're, yeah. Okay. And then, so oh, we're talking about the downward slope. Yep. Here. And, and at what age do we start putting D, do not DNR on my refrigerator? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, you're not terminally ill, so why okay. you're not you're not there? If your heart stops, you want to you want to keep going, right? But if you get to be a hundred, you might just consider yourself terminally ill. Well, okay. So maybe I should have taken the DNR part. Uh, and put that in a separate section because the DNR part is whether you're terminally ill or not, okay. I believe. And the living will is really only if you're terminally ill. The yeah, because but I don't know if they'd allow you to be DNR well, at my, the hospital. My dad had Alzheimer's yeah. He had a DNR. Yeah. Uh, now that's not exactly right. how it went. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really interesting question because people with Alzheimer's are, can be physically tremendously healthy. So are they term terminally ill or not? They're not, but they, they do, you know. They don't want to be. Right. To and back. that was, um, that was uh, so that would be a good example of when you're not terminally ill and you still want to be DNR. Yeah. Yeah. And that um, is in my. Um, and that works, right? Yeah, it works. But the, actually, the woman I was talking about before who was a nurse practitioner who picked someone up beside her husband, she was talking about her mom having Alzheimer's, and she said, you know, just think of it, antibiotics, for example, prolong life. And I noticed they have antibiotics on the most form. And if, you know, if she was saying, I wanted them not to give my mom antibiotics, but they said that wasn't an extraordinary measure. We couldn't withhold that. So I think it's kind of like what the last speaker was talking about. You have to really find people that you're going to work with. That, like what you were saying, you know, my dad was DNR, but it didn't really go that way. Yeah. You know, it sounds like the facility he was in. There's just this mentality among he health. He didn't, he didn't quickly go. Yeah. He didn't have to be resuscitated. Oh, okay. So nothing. So it wasn't like they were keeping yeah. him alive. But I had his health care power of attorney. Yeah. And um, he fell. Yeah. And they asked me if, if they, and it hit his head. If yeah. They want to send him to the hospital, and I said, well, what are they going to do? Yeah. And they said, well, we'll check for a brain bleed, and I said, no, please do not send him. Yeah. And that just all worked. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Mm hmm Because I always tell, you know, some people get uncomfortable with the living will language because they think people are going to go around not giving them medical care or something. Actually, I suspect it's the other way around. Yeah, it is the other way around. People are more inclined to say, save them, save them, forget what. Right, right. But what I tell people, and they say, I just want to leave, you know, say it's a married couple, and they say, I just want to leave it up to my wife. When the time comes, let her make the decision. And I always tell people, the advantage of the living will is that you have evidence of what she wanted. She signed this document saying what she wanted. So if her family, say her parents come down and say, why aren't you, you know, treating her brain bleed, blah, blah, blah. But she had stage four cancer. She didn't want any more treatment. She just wanted to go. How do you know that? Well, look, she signed this. 
you know, so it can help the person making the decision. Um, so uh, I put some language in here from the statute about when the um, living will comes into effect. Um, and then I also stated in the, in the outline here that uh, in my document, I add um, a provision, what happens if I'm in a persistent vegetative state, which is basically a coma from which there's no reasonable likelihood of recovery. Um, so that's not in the statute. We don't really know what would happen if, if that was um, Karen Ann Quinlan. Was she in the home and she, she didn't wake up and her family fought? And there, I think there was recently a case in Virginia where the state intervened to keep someone alive, which some people were very upset about. So I certainly don't want to be kept artificially alive. I'd love to use the example of Ariel Sharon because he was, <laughs> he was in a coma for six years just lying there and people thought he was blinking his eyes at them, you know, talking to them. But, um, you know, that to me, it's a, it's a very sad way to go. Um, and then uh, you can have a separate living will for dementia, like we were talking about some of the issues about you no know, antibiotics, kind of a little less, maybe a little less medical treatment than even extraordinary measures, you know. Um, and in the backup materials, I have a link to, uh, nonprofit that has a um, special advanced directive for uh, dementia that goes through different stages. If I have stage one, where I'm just kind of forgetting words, like Gina, no. <laughs> or you know, if I have stage two, where I don't um, know my kids' names or birthdays, if I have stage three, where I don't know my own name, you know, it goes through all that. And you can check different boxes as to what you want. No, it's a, but I have the link online, so if she puts the backup material online. Um, but if you, if you, it's, the link is... Um, Should we have advanced directive and a, a living will for dementia? Um, it's up to you. You could read the dementia one and see if you, if you like it. I, I personally did it because I want my husband to know that I really am very uncomfortable with the whole dementia thing. And, uh, you know, when the, someone asked at the last presentation, I don't want to be a drain to my family. What do I do? I, even though the you know, end of life, people are not supposed to advocate for that. I feel very strongly about that, both financially and just, you know, the amount of time and attention it takes to take care of someone like that. I just really, and I don't, it's just not the way I want to live, so. Sorry, where is the form? Okay, so it's going to be on the form, uh, but it, if you go to um, dementia-directive.org, dash, hyphen, I guess I should say. Yeah. Directive. Yeah. No, this is for the. Um, yeah, dementia one. Oh yeah. Right. Keep up with our bodies unless they get some cures or something. Mm. Yeah, I have the link uh, for the most form, too, um, which is um, dchealth.dcgov, no, sorry, dchealth.dc.gov backslash most, M-O-S-T. But if you, if you just Google DC uh, most form, I think you get that. Oh, we're going to talk more about the most form. Yeah, we sort of talked about it already that um, the most um, form is filled out by you and a doctor or it's, they, they say MD slash DO. So I had to look up DO was a doctor of osteopathy. Oh, okay. so, so it was interesting, Mary, uh, when she was talking in the plenary session that her doctor has given her this form several times. Yeah. And I go to the same medical practice yeah. with a different doctor. Yeah. And I never heard this form until uh, a few weeks ago. Wow. What does that say about you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of this before. Yeah. It, so, but I think it's, it's I, what I'm reading or what I'm kind of intuiting, is this a damn good thing to have? Yeah, I think so. And what I like about it is that the doctor ordered it. They're a lot better able to explain the different... Um, uh, different um, choices than a lawyer is, right? Because they know about this stuff. Is this doctor dependent? In other words, your doctor, you execute this for your doctor, but you might end up in an 
emergency room yeah. and treated by another doctor. Yeah. Well, that all gets into the issue of how do people know what your medical records are. And luckily now, if That's you go to... Well, no, no, actually, you know, like if you're with Kaiser, right, you're going to go to Kaiser doctor, they're going to fill out something like this, going to be in the computer, and then you go to a Kaiser hospital and they pull up your name and they're going to have it. But if you go to just Joe Blow independent doctor and then you go to Georgetown Hospital, they're not going to have this necessarily. But now apparently a lot of medical providers are sharing, they have these systems that go to, you know, everybody can key into everybody else's system. So um, what we tell you when you fill, come to our office and you fill out your health care power of attorney living will is we give you an extra copy to give to your doctor. So how does it get from your, your medical record at your doctor's office to a hospital? You know, that's something you've got to figure out. And that might be the role of the person acting for you, that they show up and they're like, hey, she signed this, living will, here, put this in the chart. Yeah. And they put it in the chart, but then the doctor has to order the DNR. So that's the step that is taken. You don't have to take that step if you have this. Okay. This kind of takes care of that. Yeah. And then the five wishes, which Ari's going to do, um, is a user-friendly form, which I said... Um, and it's great about um, starting a conversation between the two people involved. And it contains some um, non-legal things that are not in most legal documents, like, what song do I want to be paid at my funeral? <laughs> I had this client, and he wrote the most beautiful letter. We always suggest, you know, instead of putting funeral instructions in your will, that you just write a memo about it. And this client wrote this beautiful memo about how he wanted his personal representative to on his dime, of course, fly to Colorado, take this certain drive through these certain mountains to this certain park and put his ashes there and make sure to appreciate the beauty of the sky <laughs> and the pine trees. And I just had this view of this guy like driving along being so happy, you know, both the dead guy and the guy who was going to take his ashes yeah. just being so happy about it. Uh, and it was very nice. Yes, as we said, you know, in all states, it, what, like we, when we do the five wishes, we notarize them. Um, so if you, it's a book. It's the five wishes, um, who you want to make decisions for you, um, what kind of medical treatment you want or don't want, comfort level, um, how you want to be treated, and then what you want your loved ones to know. Oh, okay. So thank you. Uh, I, I can endorse this um, on the receiving end. That um, several years ago, uh, there was a, um, two men, a couple, and um, one was very ill. And thank God, they moved into the Cashman area of the Capitol Hill Village, so we could get them a membership. So this was this was important: is getting them a membership, so then I could take the Capitol Hill Village social worker to sit down and figure out what was going on. And these were two guys from our church, so. Uh, in that, she introduced five wishes. I'd never heard of it. And he completed it, the sick one, completed it. He got it all signed and everything. And then life went on. He eventually, a few months later, he was in the hospital. He was in the hospital for a long time. He was in rehab. He was back in the hospital, back in rehab. He was, had this breathing tube. Is that the thing? Uh-huh, yeah. They, they screwed it up, and he ended up uh. brain dead at uh. the Washington Hospital Center. And so now what do you do? And he had his mother and family, I guess the family still lived in Kentucky. And so here's his now husband um, with, but he had the five wishes document with the signatures and everything. And so he felt comfortable in uh, making the decision that take him off of life support. But he was able to send this copy of the five wishes to this man's mother. Mm -hmm. And that, Having her look at it and see in her, her son's own handwriting what he wanted, and this was consistent, that it was a huge relief uh, all the way around. It's a legal document or? Yeah, so if you complete the five wishes, it's basically a health care power of attorney and a living will put together. Okay. And uh, the only problem with it is it's really hard to scan. <laughs> because <laughs> They need to make it, uh, and, um, um, my office used to have a, a copier that did two sides like that, um, but, but the booklet form yeah, is hard to scan. Now they have all these online things, right? So when you were talking about how does your DNR follow you or your 
Living will follow you to the hospital. There are online services you can sign up for now where you do all this stuff and it's like in your Apple passport or whatever. So when you get to the hospital, your loved one shows up and says, hey, just go in their phone or they're able to get in your phone or maybe they have a copy through the phone and, oh, look, here it is, you know, on my computer, on my phone. Gina, this has been terrific. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome.